The Full Exposure Podcast is made possible by Metro Health, University of Michigan Health, and Dr. Peter Hahn in appreciation for the contributions that artists and creative minds provide to our community. Arts and culture are essential to a rich and rewarding life, strengthening our overall well-being and our appreciation of all that we see, hear, and experience. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of Full Exposure with me, your host, Brian Kelly. This is an exciting episode for a couple of reasons. I really like Emily Petersmark, our guest today. And it's also um, the premiere episode where we're rolling out something brand new. It's another layer. It's another layer to the Full Exposure podcast cake, if you will. You know, if you think of a podcast as a cake... This could be some frosting coming your way. And uh, we're rolling out, we're debuting something called Studio Sessions. And uh, let me just break that down a second for you. And uh, Studio Sessions are when we have a guest on that is a singer, songwriter, uh, a performer. Um, They're going to perform an acoustic song in the studio. And we're going to film it and share it as its own separate video. And uh, I'm super excited that Emily agreed... um, to sing us a song it's a it's a beautiful song that she uh powerfully performed here in the studio and uh it's called empty spaces and you can see that bonus content on the full exposure podcast.com website along with other video excerpts of our conversation with emily and of course, there's the portraits I make of Emily uh, just before we sat down and have a conversation. And this one went kind of like this. She came in, she arrived, we uh, did the portrait. That's usually how it goes. And then after the portrait was finished, we sat down, had a conversation for about an hour. And then after that was wrapped, uh, she busted out the acoustic guitar and uh, just knocked it out, just blew the lid off this place in the studio and I um, I'm very proud of the video uh, it's a it's a I was so pleased to have Emily be the premier artist to um, launch studio sessions with and um, you can check in, check that out you want to see this performance um, and all you need to do is go to Emily's episode page at fullexposurepodcast.com and go to the video gallery and you'll be able to see that performance along with other snippets of our conversation. So uh, without further ado, let me launch into a formal intro here of Emily Petersmark. Emily is an incredibly talented singer-songwriter who is best known as the co-lead singer of the very successful four-piece indie folk band, The Crane Wives. Emily and I really can't pin down how we come to know each other. But we don't let it slow us down. We kind of explore it, probe around. We just can't figure out how we met each other probably 12 years ago or something like that. But, uh, you know, we let it go. Sometimes you don't know how you know people. And then, uh, and then you figure, good enough, we're going to just uh, launch into a great conversation. Uh, and in this conversation, Emily, Emily uh, just breaks down how to survive in the music business, the grind of touring as a band, the craft of songwriting as well as discovering her sexual identity in the mid-2000s. It's an engaging, really cool conversation. I I didn't expect some of the twists and turns in our conversation, and really my takeaway is just how passionate she is about music, about performing, and just where she is in life in terms of thinking about her future. She's only 32 years old, and uh, there's, there's a lot of career left for her, but she's already thinking about what's next. Um... And then we have, the, of course, the, the great video performance. And, um, and before we launch into the episode, I, I do want to just update you about some upcoming stuff, uh, which, I, again, I'm super excited. This is a great time for our podcast. And um, as you know, we went out to Los Angeles. We shot five episodes out there. We've released two of them, uh, Rob Bell and uh, actress Stacey Hyduck. And we have three more to go, which will be launching uh, in the following subsequent weeks. It will be a lot of Los Angeles content. But I wanted to pause Los Angeles for a second, bring it back to Grand Rapids, and um, launch a studio session episode 
with Emily Petersmark. She's been on my list for a while to chat to, uh, chat with, and um, I, I couldn't have been more pleased when she was able to come in and um, and have this conversation. So we're in Grand Rapids this week with, with Emily, and then a few episodes are in the can from Los Angeles. We also have another one for, uh, in Detroit that we shot a month or two ago. And uh, just getting ready for the end of the year and the holidays. We're going to end very strong. 2019 is going to end very strong, and I'm super excited about 2020 and the podcast. We are going full bore. And uh, some of the best things you can do for me to keep this podcast going is give me some feedback and uh, drop us a note. Send us a DM on Facebook or Instagram. Um, Shoot me an email at brian at briankellyphoto.net. I love feedback. I love hearing uh, some of your favorite episodes, how we can improve. And, um, and, and so don't be afraid to reach out. I, I like to dialogue with you guys and we're doing it for you. If you don't, uh, you know, if it weren't for you guys, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't have a podcast. So, um, with that, let's jump into this episode. Let's explore the bigger picture with singer songwriter, Emily Petersmark. ASMR. 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 And I hate it, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not happening. Uh. <laughs> it's funny because um, it is a weird thing. Like, uh, but I also I understand the appeal. But like, there are people that really like it. Like, you're a little weird. <laughs> you know, I'm I know, a- but it's like nails on a chalkboard. I feel like I've spent so much time trying to remove mouth noises from all of my right. like audio that yeah, to hear someone breathing wetly into a microphone well, is just not something I want. I always notice, and that nothing like starting a podcast and having to listen and edit your own podcast in your own <laughs> voice. But like, there's this thing where I'm like. Oh, and uh, I got to start sentences like that. And I was like, why did I, like, no. what? I don't have this in my mouth. Like, it's a habit. Like, why is that? I don't know. When we're recording in the studio, there's always, like, that five seconds before you get pre-roll where you're just like, <coughs> <coughs> just getting ready to go. <laughs> so this interview's going great already. It's already. Solid. We've made a lot yeah. of, like, annoying noises. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's not been... Talked about all the ways we could sell out in our respective fields. It's great. Yes. <laughs> well, we just had a yeah, we just had a great photo shoot, and I realized that we stumbled on a business partnership that mm. we're going to launch. I hope very soon. Oh, absolutely. Is we we have to go to Grand Rapids, Minnesota, create a calendar. Twelve month spread. A twelve month <laughs> traditional wall calendar for the kitchen <laughs> that has uh, yeah Judy Garland's uh, mm-hmm. home. In it. Exactly. So that way, when someone asks you if you have photos of Grand Rapids, of Minnesota. Grand Rapids, yeah, because they didn't read the fine print in your Facebook profile, you right. can always just have something on hand. Yeah, I can always so sell that you them. can still take their money. What a great pilgrimage that would be. <laughs> We're going to Judy Garland's hometown, <laughs> so we can here's capitalize. Here's the diner her mom worked at, <laughs> and then here's her home. Did you watch that biopic? No, her? I haven't. You know what? I just don't like that. And, it, and other people like, there's something about an era in American movie cinema that it just misses like the, I don't know. But Garland isn't in that, like her as an actress. I mean, yeah. her life is fascinating. And Liza. That's a, kind of went off my radar. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> it wasn't in my wheelhouse of things to like uh, hold on to. Like I need to dig into this. Right. Absolutely. What did you think of the movie though? So I didn't see it, but I... I know a little bit about Julie, Judy Gardner because I went on a deep dive in college after watching um, The Dark Side of Oz. You know, when you like oh, loop yeah, together yeah. the dark side of the moon. <laughs> I did not do drugs in college, but I did all the stuff that stoners do. Yeah. Um, but uh, after that, I was just reading about her life, and it's fascinating to me um, to look into celebrities who kind of go off the deep end because of their celebrity. Right. And you kind of wonder if it's um, the job that does it to them, this, like the pressure and yeah. uh, the fame, or if it's like an underlying condition that's not mm-hmm. um, addressed, if more performers and artists are more inclined to be depressed. or. I think the question is, how do you handle it? 
you know, oh, I, how are you how, at this level? <laughs> well, I do drugs now. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. It's perfect. I'm glad we're recording this. Yes. This is going to be great. Well, it's all going out. <laughs> Mom, she's fine. Uh, but no, you know, I, yeah, it is fascinating, like the psychology of handling it. And oh, then, absolutely. Like, the, the child actors that come out of stuff and it's like you can you can pin it on the wall like they're gonna be a mess later oh absolutely i remember watching like hannah montana and thinking like (laughs) someday there's gonna be a line that she crosses (laughs) there's a reckoning maybe it was when she was riding a giant microphone on stage and maybe i feel like it was the wrecking ball video and that was like the catalyst for like Maybe she's lost a little bit of control over her image and what she wants, but it's fine. Well, I think <laughs> what's odd is she's, I think I like her music. I really enjoy yeah. her music. Yeah, yeah, and I also like, I don't know, but I think there's that, what was she, 22, 23 when it came out? Yeah. And she's been famous most of her life. So. And that's the thing. Like, what do you, what can you do when you're established as like a Disney star and then you're told like, this is what you have to do every day of your life and yeah. we're going to police all of these aspects of you as a person, of course you're going to Oh, you're going to go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> because other people during that time period have so much control over you. They're running your finances. They're mm. managing you. They're making, you know, I don't know. You just, I think it's a little prison that they put kids in, but... <laughs> Disney. <laughs> what do I know? It's a Disney prison. No, I agree. I So I'm, I remember mocking that, like, leave Britney alone video when I was in <laughs> high school. And now as an adult, I'm like, no, no. <laughs> Britney Spears was a victim, and we were all way too mean. Yeah. But it it's fascinating to Isn't me. Isn't that all of it, though? I think all of us are meaner now. I oh, we're so is. mean. Yeah. I mean, I don't think face-to-face. It's the, it's, the, it's the social component where you can just say whatever, and you're not accountable because you'll never see that person in, in person. I mean, that's definitely a part of it. But I also feel like it's been a lot easier to... Um, disassociate from other people because mm. we're so like locked into our our individual phones our individual screens right. and I'm sure like people are listening to this on a phone or a screen right but uh, I also think that it it kind of as much as a gift as the internet has been in connecting people it also isolates quite a bit as well Oh, for sure I mean we're already seeing you know I have daughters so they're mm. how old are you now I'm 32 okay so 32 is still you know I'm, I'm much older, 51. <laughs> but I have a daughter who's 20 and 18 and, mm. and 14. So Ooh. there's already these studies. Yeah, exactly. Teenagers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. For those who can't see Emily's face, she did that. Oh, <laughs> I have bad so much sympathy. <laughs> I This is why I don't want kids because I know I'll have a kid that's like me as a teenager and I, I can't live that curse. So. <laughs> You're just like, I hope my kid's nicer than I was. <laughs> no kidding. You no, know, uh, I'm pretty lucky. My kids are, are mm. great. But the... Um, but anyway, how it, yeah, it is easy to isolate and retreat into these uh, virtual worlds, be it social media or different apps or games or uh, so many ways. I was at, oh gosh, where were we? I was up north. I had to go up to Traverse City to do mm-hmm. a shoot. And I was at this little, dun- I like to, maybe you're the same on the road, but... Uh, I like to find greasy spoon diamonds, yeah. right? Like it, oh, if it's yeah. if it looks like it was been there since the fifties and it's a little greasy, I love those places for breakfast. I know? absolutely. I, I mean, I especially love it when the coffee is like a little bit burnt. Oh, like yeah. you know what I mean. Anything that's open twenty four hours. About those mugs that they all have too. It's the same mug. I it's love small. those mugs. They have to come fill them up like eight times. But you get to know your waitress that yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, there was a family there, and this kid. They had two kids. One was maybe three, and they had like a maybe eight-year-old boy, and he didn't even eat his meal. He was on his phone gaming, like mm-hmm. completely detached for forty minutes. That I was there, sitting like next to them. I was like, "Is this kid ever gonna eat or like <laughs> engage?" He was heads down on a tablet. I was like, "Oh, what does this mean for us?" Not that we're gonna figure it out on this podcast. Probably not. But yeah. I, <laughs> and also I will say that like I I think that it's awesome to have technology that connects us in ways that like I remember being a very lonely, awkward kid in East Michigan. Yeah. And not really having um, an opportunity to to meet other people that were like me. Yeah. Um, and so I think that the internet is great for that. Yeah. And a lot of times the idea that people are like checked out when they're in their phones, they're usually just engaged mm-hmm. in something that's like farther right. away. 
But because of that, it eliminates a lot of the need for face-to-face yeah. interaction. Yeah. And I feel like we've lost the ability a little bit to do that as as easily yeah. as maybe typing something There's out There's on one phone. thing I notice uh, with my kids and even like the generator, uh, you met Mark, who works with me a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, there's even things like he'll handle certain communications. He goes right to texting. And I'm like, okay. well, why don't I just call? I love call texting, real quick. though. Yeah, no, it's great. And I, I'm texting more than I can, but it was like sometimes it's about work or you want to call, you know, or emailing or something. Anyway, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. But I notice my daughters are like, and their friends, even when they're having problems, they text through them. Oh, yeah. Little conflicts. Whereas, like, it could have been like, oh, that could have been a 45 second phone call of like just clearing the air. That's so generational, though. It is, like, I, guess. I, I haven't used my phone as a phone with anybody <laughs> but my mom. Like, in so long, if someone's right, calling right. me, I assume someone has died. Yeah. You know, like, it's yeah, bad. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. My heart just plummets yeah. if I. If it's a number I recognize that's calling me. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> which is never the case now. We're getting more robocalls than ever. But no kidding. Well, you mentioned something I, I just want to dig into. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you felt awkward and sort of isolated and not know people. So lo- what layers of that did you describe when you felt a little bit different than other people? Oh, where so you grew up? I I grew up um in White Lake, Waterford, you know, yeah. like outside of Pontiac. Inside, north Detroit. Yeah. Way north Detroit. Way, way north. <laughs> like the place where all the white not people Not even left. Detroit, yeah. but like some people still claim <laughs> it as Detroit. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I I mean, it was a a nice place to grow up, and I met a lot of really wonderful people there, but I also felt like um, there weren't, like, a lot of minorities, Mm -hmm. any kind of minorities there, and um, when I was in school, there were not a lot of, like, out um, LGBTQ individuals Mm -hmm. at all. Um, I didn't know the word bisexual until, like, college, you know, I was either gay or lesbian, and so um, there wasn't a lot of discussion about those issues. And as like a teenager going through puberty, I was had a lot of questions. Right, right. Very confused. The internet was invaluable in that aspect because yeah. it connected me with um, communities of people who are also experiencing that isolation, right. um, which is amazing. So it was. I'm assuming. Uh, it was harder because they weren't these defined... Like, it's harder, as much as we're not supposed to, like, generalize and put people in buckets, but you didn't literally find, like, I'm not part of this thing and I'm not really that thing. Yeah. And it wasn't really something that was talked a lot about sexuality. It just wasn't part of, like, your... The, the conversation of growing up at the yeah, time. sure. Because um, I graduated in 05. Right. So it was, like, right at the, that turning point where I think the internet started to get a little bit... Uh, more integrated into everyone's like yeah. daily life. Sure. Um, but a lot of these marginalized voices were still um, kind of hiding because it's safer to, to not draw attention to yourself if you're very different. Right. And so I remember um, my band teacher in high school, uh, he was living with his male roommate, and we were all speculating about whether or not the, they were, <laughs> were room, quote unquote yeah. roommates. Yeah. Um, because he had had a kid from a previous marriage, and it, it was all just speculation. He is sure. definitely gay, and he's right. awesome. But I didn't find that out until after I had graduated. Um, he didn't come out publicly until after that as well. Yeah. So there weren't a lot of opportunities to have a conversation about um, like the nuances of sexual identity sure. or uh, gender identity or any of that. Mm-hmm. So it's it's fascinating now to see I that there's heard, more. Uh, did you hear any of the Kristen Stewart interview on Howard Stern? No. I just saw a video clip on YouTube or something, and, mm-hmm. and she was talking about even just three years ago when everyone was trying to label her or make her vocalize who she is and what she is. And and she's like, even now, like three years later, it's so much easier for people than it was even three, four years ago. Yeah. Because of people's, the, just the amount of information and also the movements and like communities you can be, feel like you're aligned with and mm-hmm. part of. And anyway, that was just the snapshot was this like you're you're talking about back then in 2005, which wasn't that long ago. It was not that long ago. Not that long ago, ago, but like even Kristen Stewart, an actress, is, is, you know, time stamping it from three years ago and seeing how 
you know, things are changing and uh, so quickly. So quickly. It's, it's scary. Like, I feel like every day I become a little bit more like my mom in the sense that, like, technology baffles me <laughs> to such a degree. The old, you're, the old, <laughs> you're the old 32-year-old. We need to put the brakes on this. I just, it's, it's amazing, but I, I also feel like I, like I just switched over from an Apple, like um, an iPhone to a Google Pixel, yeah. which they're both pretty much exactly the same. <laughs> but for some reason, I'm st- I keep not knowing how to navigate this phone, and yeah. it, it's not as intuitive as it was. Um, I just so I don't you're know. You're the grouchy, like I can't. I just don't understand how to get to my <laughs> voicemail. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it changes, and uh, yeah, we get so accustomed to particular platforms that it's uh, it's been hard. I like to settle into one thing and then just do that one thing. Like I used the same version, like CS5 Photoshop for really? like 10 years. Yeah. You got your money's worth out of that I license. really did. <laughs> wow. Well, um, how has that affected your writing as a, when you write? Uh, I mean, obviously every artist brings their totality of time from mm. birth to the moment you're writing is all this great baggage and luggage that we all bring to our art. But like, um, is there, have you noticed a particular sort of perspective that you write through in your music? For sure. I, I feel like when I started writing music, it wasn't with the intention of sharing. So a lot of it comes from, uh, a more private perspective. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of talking about, it, it's kind of my catharsis and like self therapy, if that makes right. any sense. It's a, a way to process a lot of stuff. And so, what's that like to then perform it publicly and then record it and share it in a way <laughs> that it's like, this isn't me like just working out stuff and sketching music that helps me process things. What's it like then to have it it's, out it, into the it's terrifying a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I, so I, I recently went and talked, my, our drummer Dan teaches a class at Aquinas about songwriting, and I talked to his students about this. And it's one of those things, like, the, the more you become aware of the things that you're saying, the more scary it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that I feel like we've reached this point with our music where we, we have intention about the things that we want to say to our audience, to our listeners... Um, especially in terms of normalizing things like mental illness and um, like the darker, more flawed feelings of being a person. <laughs> yeah, which I think everybody has those same thoughts yeah. if we're really honest about it. Exactly. You know? And it's one of those things, like it, it's scary in the sense that you're like, you're very vulnerable when you're telling those stories. But at the same time, I, I do feel a sense of empowerment when I get to frame them the way that I want to right. and, like, take control of the narrative right. and um, kind of hopefully help other people understand themselves a little bit better as yeah. I'm using it to understand myself. Yeah. Well, intuitively, I think what I like about your music is that you don't, I don't, in, I don't get the intention or I don't get the feeling that your intention is to help people. No. <laughs> it's through the, you know, it's through the rawness of your what you write and how you perform it and and all of that that through that authenticity comes whatever people want to read into it if they read I they can co-align and feel uh alignment with what you're saying or feeling or saying, you know, singing. Sure. Uh that's where the help involved is in that community that you're on Oh, intentionally community. You're just uh, you're just creating. being you're just being present. Like you're just being um, a part of the community as you are, so that other people who are similar can feel less alone. Yeah. And so we don't talk about fixing any of these problems yeah, that yeah, we right. talk about, but we do we do um, try to normalize having them. Yeah. And um, I feel like that was what was missing from like my hometown community, mm-hmm. and it's kind of something that has been built a lot through the internet, um, that just that visibility of of seeing people with all different types of struggles and then being able to find um, people whose struggles kind of coincide with yours so that you don't feel so alone in that. Yeah. All right, I have two things to 
it'll sound like I'm being sidetracked and getting sidetracked, <laughs> but it is circling back around. I trust you. One is when I was making uh, your coffee or getting your cup of coffee, mm-hmm. for one, I gave you the TCB. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's Elvis's mug. Really? It's, uh, it's his logo. Uh, TCB is taking care of business with the lightning bolt. Very And nice. I got it at Graceland. And uh, it was that logo was on like hit one of his planes or both his planes that are there. And, um, or no, it was Lisa Maria. And then his other plane that was for Colonel Parker uh, mm. has the logo of TCB on it. So taking care of business. But as I was um, getting your coffee, you were talking to Mark about Grand Rapids and you were peaking, um, especially given our conversation to this point. What you said about Grand Rapids is not something that you often hear from people who are have had that background where they felt a little displaced, felt maybe they didn't find their community. And that's kind of one of the rubs about Grand Rapids. But it would tell me again about your love of Grand Rapids and kind of how you felt. I just heard from the kitchen, yeah. you know? <laughs> and so uh, you got to Grand Rapids and you went to Grand Valley here. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you're studying? I was studying uh, communications and advertising, Uh which at the time was like mostly print advertising. So they let us set the scene in 2005. Um, But they were still etching monks into (laughs) dot. Yeah, I understand. They were chiseling the news. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Newspapers existed, you know, like it was a different time. (laughs) And, (laughs) um, but I, I had come from this community of people, well, like a a lack of community. I I had just graduated high school, and my goal was to go someplace that no one from my hometown would be. Like, I just wanted Mm -hmm. a a fresh start. And so I went to Grand Valley, um, and I was excited because they were offering, at the time, I got in through a diversity scholarship. So, like, they gave me money for being Asian, which Mm -hmm. was, like, dope at the time. Yeah, right. (laughs) But also, it, it kind of set this expectation that I would go to school and meet other people of color, which I didn't really have a lot of opportunity to do that in Waterford or White Lake. Mm -hmm. So coming out to Grand Rapids, I was really surprised. Um, It's still very segregated and still, like, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of work to be done. Yes, absolutely. But I I was um, immediately welcomed into this community of students and creatives, um, like, especially through music. I... Like I said, I had no intention of of really pursuing music. Mm-hmm. Um, I was concerned about making money. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, print advertising was where I really wanted to stack my yeah, chips. Right. But um, oh, print. <laughs> be gone in five years, kid. But yeah, here's your degree. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, but that said, it it was such a, a warm and welcoming community of people who really wanted to nurture whatever message you had. Um, there wasn't a lot of competition. Everybody was very encouraging and, and um, mm-hmm. wanted collaboration. Sure. And that was something that I hadn't experienced at all. And I really fell in love with that feeling. Did you have a sense of thirst of wanting that when you went there, like in your 18 year old brain? Were you like, I want, <laughs> I mean, just, yeah, am I going to find people, even though you might not even be able to? fully kind of like understand who you were at 18 mm. and like you do now of course but or uh was that something that just sort of occurred to you like oh my gosh this is you know you're two three months in and you're like oh my gosh my friends are all kinds of different people oh I I definitely think that I I wanted change like I I there was only one person from my graduating class that went to Grand Valley, and I never saw her. Mm-hmm. And that was the best. Right. I thought it was amazing to get this opportunity to to um, be a little bit more open about who I was in a, in a, a place where nothing had been established. Sure. Um, you are whoever you want to be the first exactly. day you show up. Yeah. Yeah, and no one has any kind of context for you as a person, so right. you get to build that yourself. There's no, like, you know, you didn't score the winning basket at the buzzer and lost the whole game. Oh, and yeah. No one remembers you pee in your pants in third grade. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, like it's, right, right. There's nothing, there's none of that baggage that comes with being like the weirdo kid from, yeah. you know, like elementary school, middle school. And I was really excited to, to start fresh. Mm-hmm. But I think I was definitely hungry to meet people from different walks of life. And 
I, I loved meeting people. Like I, we met a lot of exchange students at Grand Valley yeah. and, and got to... For Allendale, it's a pretty amazing right, campus. Right, no kidding. Know, like it's farmland around it, and that's still like this oasis. Of, well, that's what's great about higher education mm-hmm. of those campuses, you know. It's like everybody from everywhere. Sure. My daughter is at college, and I can't, I, you know, she's in Ann Arbor, and I was just like... Woof. There's so many. There's, <laughs> There's a lot so, of stuff. <laughs> well, every I mean everything. There's the amount of Chinese ch- students from China, mm. and just that's the like, best Korean food I've had in Michigan is in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hands down. No, I mean I don't. I can't even remember that we had like an American bistro style meal there because we're always <laughs> like, oh, there's great every kind of food other than what we normally eat. Mm-hmm. That was good. And that's a, that's a thing. Like we we didn't really have that on the east side. I I wasn't traveling a lot into Detroit, Mm -hmm. um, especially not as a teenager, but I, it, it's fascinating now to see like this Detroit Renaissance as well. Yeah. Um, it's, I think that there's obviously a lot of, um, critiques that can be made about how we lift up communities, um, that have been oppressed and marginalized for so long. But Mm -hmm. I do think that it's really amazing that now, Detroit, especially, and, and East Michigan is getting this um, artistic renaissance in which, right. like, marginalized voices have an opportunity to be heard yeah. on an equal platform for once, which right. is really exciting. Well, there's the momentum there is breathtaking. Mm-hmm. But drill into a little more about Grand Rapids just because you, I mean, you obviously, you, when you graduate, you could go anywhere in theory in yeah. terms of, like, you know, you're done with school now. Mm-hmm. But you stayed in Grand Rapids, and you still here, and you <laughs> and you like it here. Gosh darn it! I do. I yeah. I am constantly in awe of the intention of Grand Rapids. I think, I think that it wants so badly to be a welcoming and comfortable artistic place, and there are a lot of people who are out there like hustling to make that happen. Yeah, and I find that really respectable. I I think that it has this great establishing. Um, feeling of community and collaboration mm-hmm. that uh, it just doesn't exist outside of of Michigan. In my experience, we've traveled a lot, yeah, and we've we've definitely seen that in the music community, especially um, that people want to be supportive and want to like make the arts a priority, right? Which you don't see other places. Yeah, it is trying. I think. Um like any community, I'm not picking on Grand Rapids, but there's so <laughs> many, I think any city of any size has these same problems, but mm-hmm. we have these um, systems that in place that aren't necessarily uh, intentionally racist anymore, but they continue but they to definitely per- they are, perpetuate yeah. racist sort of outcomes or economic outcomes that are absolutely uh, not equitable. Well, it's so, a city that was like built yeah. by the Dutch. <laughs> yeah, they controlled everything. Yeah. Well, I'm mean, just even like, our school, well, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but just like you take <laughs> our uh, property, sc- our school, or, or, you know, how millages, property taxes pay yeah. for schools. Oh, absolutely. So, you know. Charter mm, schools versus public schools, all, all that well, crap. Well, all of it, just like, you know, if everything's based on the value of a home and how that's how much money goes to the school, of course the suburban schools, are with high, you know, they have more money. It just perpetuates mm. this thing, and it's not about education or what's right or doing, like, every child should should be educated equally. <laughs> well, it, it's uh, fascinating. So I just bought a house, um, like, right on the edge of East Grand Rapids. Mm-hmm. and I live out there, too. I'm just, like, two houses out. What? Yeah. Uh, I, I love that area. In it's, East Town, or where are you at? Yeah, I'm in East Town. Yeah. I'm, like, four blocks south of Wolfgang's. Nice. So, yeah. That's... I'm just in Ottawa Hills, like, just nice. knocking on your... Oh, we're neighbors. Door. Yeah. Uh, I love Grand Rapids. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I... It, East Grand Rapids, I feel like, is a great example of that um, very clear segregation Mm -hmm. in terms of property value and what it can do for students in public schools. Yeah. Like, that that high school in East Grand Rapids is bonkers. Phenomenal. Absolutely bonkers. Everything's phenomenal there. Oh, it's beautiful. Facilities and... Yeah. yeah, It's so crazy. But I I grew up in a, a school where, like, we... We hadn't had like new marching uniforms since like 1986. Sure, you know sure. what I mean? So yeah. 
it's, it's fascinating to see how much you can accomplish when you have the means to do so. You need tools, one of which is money, yeah. to create an <laughs> outcome that you want to pursue. Um, That's why I'm so hungry to sell out, see? Like, yeah, see, we're selling <laughs> calendars. We need, we need the money. <laughs> but it's to do good. It's not to do, uh, not to buy we're huge We're spread mansions. it around, yeah. yeah. Not huge mansions. Um, I, uh, but we were talking that I, I can't just, our backstory is still confusing to me because <laughs> we were talking earlier during the photo shoot. We don't actually know, remember exactly how, how we, met. we met. Yeah. And one of my first, it isn't my first memory of you, but the first like thing we did is you were working at AMI music, right? Mm-hmm. Is that what it is? They were AMI licensing. entertainment network. And that was how, like, they, they're the jukeboxes that you play in bars. Yeah. And then there's the whole <laughs> licensing arm to that stuff. I don't so, understand Yeah, so we, we started this off. Was a, this is not your current job, by the no, way. No, but I, yeah. I, I support it. Yeah. Uh, it was a 100-year-old company that started off building, like, change machines and coin yeah. machines and eventually moved to, to making jukeboxes. And my job was to help license um, independent artists for our jukeboxes. Yeah. So once we started making digital boxes, um, a big part of that was trying to um, integrate local communities yeah. into those music scenes. And by it, it's so complicated to license music. I still oh, don't sure. really understand yeah, it right. that well. There's publishing, mm-hmm. and then there's copyright. Yeah, it's all this other arms to everything. Uh, it's ridiculous. But yeah, I, so I worked there for about four years and learned a lot about yeah. the industry and... Yeah. <laughs> well, then I was sent. I was doing an article about your that company that mm-hmm. you were working at, and I remember I was doing a photo shoot, and I was like, Emily, we know each, we other. Know each yeah. other from <laughs> now. We don't know why we knew each other, but I was like, Emily, perfect. Let's. Uh, so I grabbed you for a portrait, and then since then, I don't know that we've really even had a conversation. But yeah. you're, you know, by then, you know, Facebook was going. It was for a rapid growth. I think I was a, the. Mm publication I was working for for a few years and um but then I've just watched your musical career take off from I think at the time when you were at AMI you were not a performer then and I remember when the crane when crane wives started to make noise I was like that's Emily from <laughs> AMI or, you know like a, wow she had this whole other uh thing to it and I um but it's just amazing to me now to see you know how you know, the crane wives have Three or four albums now. Four, four working albums. on five. Yeah. Yeah, you're back in because mm-hmm. it's um, it's been a couple of years since you've had a full yeah. full one out. But that's just the result of people getting older and busier and things. Or um, for a while we were touring full time, yeah. so that was um, on the last album and the other yeah. stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah. Which I mean, it was a wonderful experience. I personally really like being on the road, but it is hard to fit in anything else when you're trying to make a living. Yeah. Um, touring and playing music, it, being in the studio is a huge expense and a giant amount of time when you can't make money. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. we kind of put off recording sure. um, until we were able to like kind of settle a little bit more in Grand Rapids. Yeah. So, yeah. By settle, you mean what? Like settle not touring and moving around or settle into making music or just like what do you mean by Maybe settle? a little bit of both. I, or just settling to <laughs> just live in settling. this terrible town. No. Well, we're, <laughs> we're, we're all in our 30s now and yeah. um, our drummer's married. We've all got partners and houses yeah. and pets and things. And it, it feels nice to have home base again. Sure. I yeah. feel like when we were on the road all the time, it... It was hard in ways that I hadn't expected. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily the homesickness or, um, I don't know, the, just the wear of the road. It was like not being able to put my stuff in a drawer for yeah. three weeks or, you know, not being more than 12 feet away from another human being. Right. You know, little <laughs> tiny proximity. things. Yeah. yeah. And you all like each other, but there's a limit to everything. Of course. Yeah. So it's nice to have that. And I think as we got older, the more that we realized, and we're able to communicate our needs in that respect. Mm-hmm. And so we've been trying to find a balance that works for everybody and makes everyone comfortable and happy. And we've realized that that requires being on the road a lot less. And being on the road a lot less means less money. So mm-hmm. we've all kind of picked up side hustles. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it means being home more and getting to know Grand Rapids again. Sure. 
which is exciting and, and hard and amazing at the same time. So, yeah. um, Can you talk just about the viability of the music business for a band at your level? <laughs> oh, like forever. You're talking about on the road. Well, I know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know it's incredibly hard, but like, you know, yeah. uh, the road is where you can really, I mean, obviously you can gig around town, but you can't play all the time here. Mm-hmm. And the, I don't know what you the door You oversaturate your market. Are. Yeah, right. And, you know, who knows what door deal or arrangements are, if it's a flat fee or whatever it is, it doesn't necessarily matter. There's only so much you can do mm-hmm. in your backyard. Absolutely. So you have to get out on the road at some point. You want to diversify your market and mm. and your audience and the only real way to do that unless you're really pushing like your streaming is to go out on the road yeah and i i do think that like the internet has changed a lot about how musicians structure their business yeah but i so far we haven't found anything that quite compares to the reliability and um the the immediate uh payoff of touring sure I mean, you don't always make money necessarily, but you do get immediate feedback from audience mm-hmm. members, fans, yeah. and you you make merch sales and things like that, and that all just well, goes those are the people you. that are going to end up downloading and streaming. You hope, you know. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's they already are, and that's why they went to the show. But yeah. maybe they brought a friend who didn't know you guys as exactly. well, and then now they're downloading everything. And We've been all about that yeah. word of mouth yeah. too. Like that, I think that's how we got so fortunate to have a good home base in Grand Rapids, is because mm-hmm. we were um, all youngsters just out of college, and our friends talked about us. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, you can't pay for that. It's amazing, and yeah. we're grateful for it. Um, but being on the road for the past uh, like four years is, has really illuminated uh, how how much more work goes into sustaining all of that. Yeah, it's a grind. It is I, a grind. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, because how quickly audiences forget. It's a mm-hmm. top of mind thing, and it doesn't mean that they don't appreciate or aren't looking forward to your music. It's There's eight new things coming at you every day. All the time. And you have immediate gratification in your palm at all times with your phone. And so you have to, as a performer, you have to be more interesting than anything happening on the internet. And it's, it's a big, it's a big thing. And how do you execute that with authenticity and like is in within your, like without being just like controversial for being controversial Mm -hmm. sake or being overtly this or that or. Yeah. Or gimmicky, you know, we just, I mean, yeah, we, we mostly just, you guys just play great music, well crafted. <laughs> you. you know, I mean, great we live try. performers. Yeah, we and and that's the thing. We've really cultivated the live show yeah. um, and our live performances. And I feel like that's personally where I feel more comfortable. Like I am not a big studio person. Yeah, um, I really love performing, mm-hmm. um, but I also especially love the immediate connection you get with a person when you're performing. Like sure. I love being able to have yeah. that with an audience. Yeah, um, and it's it's the streaming services have changed even how that works a little yeah. bit. Um, I, but not necessarily in a bad way. I love that listening rooms are making a big comeback. I love that. We have a listening room now. Or the, the, the <laughs> called listening room. Yeah. Are you on the docket to play there? And then we are. Yeah. I, I believe that show is sold out, though. But, I mean, that's great. <laughs> I'm sure you have some comps left. <laughs> no, I'm yeah. just, just kidding. Hit me up. You know somebody. It's fine. <laughs> I know. She's on my podcast. I'm at the door. She was on my podcast. No, um... Well, what was funny was you talk about trying to survive is uh, about the time that all that was from 2002 to 2008, mm-hmm. and I, I had a gallery called the Photography Room, mm-hmm. and I was trying to sell photography, not just my own, but other photographic artists, you know, fine art photographers, and, and we do shows, and I wasn't making any money. I was losing money, yeah. and I was the commercial work was saving, like keeping the doors open, at least paying rent and trying to put some food. It was a real struggle, but... Um, at the time, it was like 2005, six, seven. in there. We shifted to doing a listening room style thing because mm-hmm. Brian Van Ark said, you need to do the listening room. You can get about 130 seats in your gallery. Yep. Just play acoustic, set up some stuff, and that's what we did. We had Glenn Phillips from Total Wet Sprocket to come mm-hmm. a couple times, and we had other names and, uh, you know, like bands that we were booking through Fleming Artists. Nice. Oh, we like Fleming. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but that's how we did that. And there's only, the only thing I miss about the art business, 
in that space was the list, like doing those shows. Uh. Because, but now fast forward to Studio Park downtown, mm-hmm. having a listening room. Have you seen the room yet? Oh, so I actually got to do like a little preview tour nice. when it was all under construction. Cool. Um, but I haven't seen the room as now that it's finished. So I did, uh, I went, um, uh, they had some highfalutin opening and I went to that and mm. I saw it there and then I was oh, back. Oh, Kate was to, playing that, right? Uh, I missed the show. I came later, but uh, yeah, sorry. I, I went in later. <laughs> but the um, anyway, I was just back there, and I saw it that night. And then I um, I had to do a photo shoot at Studio Park for another client, not for them. But we um, they gave me, believe me or not, they they handed me a key to a couple of doors that were up on the balcony up there, Ooh. and I was like. I wanted to show the people that I was with, like, there's a listening room. I wonder if this key works for the listening room. <laughs> so we went into the listening room. So, so you so, broke into Sorry, the- Quinn. <laughs> sorry, Quinn. That, uh, that's what we did. But um, <laughs> anyway, it's a beautiful room, and I think it's perfect. It takes, like, everything up to another level from... Um, I'm going to see a show um, in a couple of weeks in December. Um, Leif, Leif, Leif Volabak, do you know him at mm. all? I'll play some of his music. It's pretty amazing but um because your show was sold out that's why I <laughs> that's the leave. only reason <laughs> that's the only reason i went to go see this hack <laughs> from canada come in god no but, I, it's a it looks like a beautiful room and i feel like grand rapids has sorely needed a space for that type of show yeah like and a consistent venue for that right yeah. lamplight tried to provide that with mm-hmm. like the house shows yeah. um which I, house shows are making a comeback too. Yeah, those little like acoustic one hundred people or yeah. less yeah. shows. I'm into Just private it. booking. You yeah, know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, you have to do. I mean, uh, there's there's a lot of abstract correlations between photography and music and mm-hmm. what you're trying to do. But like, there's you just it it comes down to. You're artist, but you have to be somehow still smart enough to hustle and find ways to get bookings and but make you know, I mean there's a you can't do everything and not oh, everything's yeah. appropriate, but at the same time you have to like parcel out and pick pick the right moments, but you do have to do things. Sometimes it's better to do something versus nothing. Oh, absolutely. And um, develop an audience through that. And there's always surprises that come out of that that you know you don't expect. Or right. maybe you think you're not gonna have a good shoot or a good show or like you're not expecting to connect with a certain type of audience that you mm-hmm. might be playing for and then all of a sudden something amazing happens with <laughs> after the show or some other connection you know mm-hmm. those types of moments that can and happen. you gotta like live for those moments because it's not an easy <laughs> job no and I man you're right though like photography and music are very similar and I feel like that you don't have to be talented to be good at it and also, you don't have to be talented to be successful. It, it comes down to organization, proper planning, and luck. You know, like you just have to have all of the pieces and perseverance. And, yep, I think burnout's a huge thing, though. Like yeah. it's such uh, like a high stress living arrangement to be a, any kind of freelance artist, where right. you're just going from gig to gig. And I don't blame people for tapping out. Um, I've seen a lot of amazing musicians kind of take a, a step back from the the big life of touring and, right. you know, like from the precipice of getting signed or or on the radio or whatever it is that denotes success. Yeah. Um, but to, to do things that are better for them, like mentally, emotionally, because it is a lot to to try and do when you're already living like this razor-thin razor margin mm-hmm. between like poverty and able right. to feed yourself sure there's that and then you have a job and then maybe you know your band will feel it i think more and more as it goes on as those family pressures mm-hmm. just uh, you know desire changing in terms of like what you know do you want to be home more than you want to be out on the road yeah. grinding it out and so th- there's a lot of things that immediately start to pull apart those uh threads of like what keeps an artist propped up together you know i mean there's a lot of tension in it Mm -hmm. and it takes years or a decade or whatever and then sometimes it it works out to be you're still performing when you're 40 and 50 and that's the thing do you i i think about that a lot about whether or not i want to still be performing when i'm 40 or 50 because i think that that will be an entirely different experience than what i'm capable of doing now 
Um, not, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Not just physically. Like it's it's hard being on the road that oh, long, sure, sleeping sure. on floors yeah. and yeah. jumping around on stage. Mm-hmm. But also um, the way that the industry um, kind of forgets about older artists that are past that threshold of like you're in your twenties mm-hmm. and you're young and beautiful and and you know yeah. the new it thing and so it's it's yeah, fascinating it happens, when, yeah, it happens when, even in my career as older mm-hmm. you know i'm 51 so a lot of people that work at ad agencies now uh in different types of creative firms or marketing firms they're most of those people are younger they're 25 to of course. 40 well if someone's in a hiring decision or like they want, want to hire a photographer or a production company mm-hmm. th- they only know kind of like a band with friends around them, so or the, you know, or they just want to work with people around their age. I'm not knocking it, but it's right. like I, now I'm 51, are arguably doing the best career work of my career mm-hmm. and like be able to deliver at a level that you know hopefully is exceeds expectations of whatever that job is. But the point is like it's not ageism; it's just more a, a result of like when I was 25 and 30. I, of course, yeah. Like who's the who's the really talented young person? Yeah. I wouldn't don't want to take opportunities away from anybody e- either because I was out hustling when I was 30, and exactly. th- so it's all a hustle. But it's and it, it's you're like your role in the the community changes. You know, yeah. like I feel like now as we're leaving this era of heavy touring and you know producing a lot of music really quickly. Now I love watching um, all of these younger bands that are now entering the scene, mm-hmm. you know, 10 years after us, um, and watching them have that, the hunger of somebody who is young and has the energy and desire to tour <laughs> 300 like, days a year. Cute? You go get it. I know. <laughs> I will support you from a distance, <laughs> from home. For sure. <laughs> I'll be in my sn- what are the, the the sn- the snuggle, <laughs> snuggies. snuggies. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, Just I call FaceTime it, me from the road. I'll be in my <laughs> Snuggie with a hot coat. I know. Can you live stream this show? <laughs> <laughs> I'll still pay you the $15 door <laughs> fee. I don't have to leave. Well, that's the thing, though. I mean, yeah. I think that's just part of, like, getting It's a older, cycle of life. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like, I don't feel old, necessarily. I don't but feel, I do feel old either, but, like, I do know, you know, it's just part of... Uh, it's part of the corporate slash uh, <laughs> arrangement of entry-level jobs into marketing and how decisions sometimes get made. Sometimes they're made more up the line, and those are older people, and they're like, I know Brian. He's done five jobs for us in the mm-hmm. over the last 10 years. Go get him. And then other people, you'll see a job posted. You know, someone will post it, like, or the company will post. Yeah. Like, here's new something, and you're like, I wonder who shot that. Like, <laughs> I didn't get a call. Like, what happened? <laughs> And I don't ask, but then eventually you find out, you know, some things. It's like, oh, well, you know, so-and-so decided that job. And then, mm-hmm. you know, it's just so many ways that it slips through your hands. Oh, so. absolutely. It's harder and harder to stay relevant. Even, I feel like even as a young person, like your window of, of 15 minutes of fame has now become 15 seconds. Yeah. And even that is generous, right. I think. Um, but that said, I think that when you focus more locally like on your community and building that up that has sustainability in ways that like aiming for being on the radio or tv and all that is just not going to give you well and you just hit you just hit the jackpot as far as like (laughs) that that sort of alignment you know like Mm -hmm. um that's why partially why i've never wanted to leave the community was like you also at the same time have everything you've yeah. Helped built and you've been supported by people and you want to support people back. Mm-hmm. And you don't do that by just being transactional and get out of town. Absolutely. And that sort of thing gives you a lot more reward than just money no. or whatever. That's, a, a, yeah, that's where is. your career happens, you know? Because like... eventually you will be 51 like <laughs> me and you're like, I, I'm glad I stayed here. You yep. know what I mean? Like, because mm-hmm. I have so much more than if I had gone off somewhere and taken, you know, I mean, and left. I, I love so many places in this world. Like, I, I love to travel, and I, it's exciting to dream about living in other places, warmer places. Yeah. But... Yeah, especially <laughs> as the turn this week. <sighs> yes. Yeah. Uh, but it is, it's wonderful to have the home base of of 
like you're supported and they support you, you know, like, and you support them. Yeah. So it feels reciprocal and, and more reason to invest. Like the more invested you get, the more you feel like you should invest more. And it's exciting to watch uh, things grow. Yeah. And when I think when I was younger, I was so focused on myself and my own crap, which uh, we We all are are as, as youngsters, but now it's it, it's exciting to kind of look at the bigger picture and, and be like, how can I make this scene sustainable for everybody, mm-hmm. you know? And and how can I make it so that other bands don't have to do that trial and error of touring, mm-hmm. you know, 200 to 300 dates a year right. and then realizing that they're still not making money. All right, I have another small confession to make. Okay. Because I, mm-hmm. uh, I think I was in an airport at the same <laughs> gate as you and your bandmates. What? In and you Boston didn't even say hi? At Logan Airport. <laughs> Were you in that Logan Airport in the last two, three, two years in Boston? I feel like we had a layover maybe when we went maybe it wasn't you guys. to New York. We, so we've flown. We've, we don't fly a lot for tour because mm-hmm. it's expensive and a headache to get anywhere with instruments okay, it wasn't on a plane. You move on. No, I don't know. <laughs> well, it might have been because yeah, yeah. we have been to New York quite a few times and I know we've had layovers. So Yeah, yeah. It's possible. You should just say hi. I'm trying to, no, I remember. <laughs> well, and I remember, so it was one of those things where I came not late to the gate, but like everybody's mm-hmm. already like up at the door, like waiting. And I was just like, I was like, oh, is that Emily? That looks kind of like Emily. And then actually I'd never seen you guys live Ooh. at that point. And I was like, these guys are really tall. Are your bandmates really tall? Yes. You guys? They're, yes, they're super Incredibly tall. Incredibly tall. Yeah. All right, so I th- it was you guys. Nice. <laughs> and then I think, yeah. Aw, you should have said hi. But then I, I don't know. Like, yeah, anyway, at the time it was kind of strange because I felt strange because mm. it, we had only done like that, that. Like it'd been, it's, I, it had been, it's strange about this conversation <laughs> and still sort of like... As little as we knew each other, even when we did the portrait shoot mm-hmm. in probably 07 or 08. Yeah. Is, um, you know, I felt like, oh, well, if I go up and talk to Emily, like, it's like, yeah, hey, remember we did that shoot at AMI? And like, oh, yeah, yeah, great. Okay, well, we'll see you in Grand Rapids. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know. And you guys were in a, uh, you guys were talking, it wasn't like you were just sitting around, you were uh, like talking. We usually use transit as opportunities to have like the big talks and capitals about yeah. the business. Well, you were having one at gate uh, 30, <laughs> 31. No, look, I have no idea. I'm, I'm assuming by that point we were probably just <laughs> bitching about being hungry and tired and yeah. <laughs> dealing with TSA with all of our You're, instruments. Oh, and, my gosh, yeah. Well, anyway, that's my other question. <laughs> um, well, next time I see you in the airport. Yeah, say uh, hi. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say hello. And we'll just chat. There um, you go. All right, so uh, I am curious about one other thing, though, that you mm-hmm. said about performing later, like you were projecting out. You yeah. Know, that is it something that you can envision just putting down, like not not from like pursuing the band, like is it something you think you will always want to do is like even if you're going up to do a, a f- 10 song set at um, whatever thing or is it something you be okay to just like sit down and go, I don't need to necessarily do that in public mm. anymore. I, you know, that's a really hard question because I do love performing, but I also feel the strain of how hard it is as time goes on. Um, but that said, I, I, I don't know, like even just like an open mic, I don't think I would ever be done performing. Yeah. I think that I'd still want some of that yeah. experience in my life, even if it's not like professionally. Yeah, you just want to play on your porch. Yeah, I would. I would love to do that. I yeah. I, I love playing house shows or for my roommates sure. when they're making dinner. You know. Yeah. Little things. I like that. Oh, I just got this idyllic picture of your <laughs> home where they're making dinner mm. and you're just strumming <laughs> some songs and singing for them as they make your your dinner. I wish that it was as <laughs> idyllic as I'm sure you're picturing, but like add a screaming cat <laughs> and so, nonsensical songs about farts and things like that. Nice. So yeah, it's <laughs> perfect. Those are the best. We're living of, the dreams. So. Yes, you are. You're totally living the dream. Uh, that's awesome. Do you do you feel like you guys need or would 
benefit from more label support or no, any support? Absolutely not. You'd rather do it on your own. Especially anymore. I feel like there's not a lot that a label could offer that you can't do in house for free. Right. Um, and with full creative control of your own stuff. Yeah. We've talked to other bands who've worked with labels and it just doesn't seem like there's enough of a benefit, um, even monetarily, to make it worth sure. signing away creative control. Well, that's it. I mean, you guys have had enough success, you know, uh, have been successful enough to go, what are you going to do for us? And what would that cost us in the long term, either creatively or financially, Mm -hmm. or just the stickiness of being accountable to somebody you hadn't been accountable before? Absolutely. And I mean, that's not to say that we wouldn't love more money. We would always love more money. That means labels should still approach you if they have an idea. (laughs) If anyone is interested out there listening and would like to sign the crane lives. We're not (laughs) anti-label. We're just saying we're not sure. It's, I just, I feel like at this point, we have been doing this for so long that we kind of have a system of, of knowing what we want and and a good idea of how to get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've gotten very accustomed to being able to release whatever we want to release. Yeah. And, and when you want to. When to say ready. the things that we want to say. And I feel like having a person overseeing all of those steps is now just an inconvenience that it, you'd have to make it financially worth it. And no label can guarantee that they can do that for you. Right. So... Yeah, I, I think it would have to be something more like we would join a team, you know, and right. like and help accept help from a team of people who yeah. wanted to like promote what we already do. But right. I don't think we're we're looking to to Does tailor just our manage stuff. your bookings and contracts and all that. Before you do you have a booking agent, or I've, is that we used to do it all in house? We've we've had a, quite a few booking agents, yeah. and because that would be the the. Heavy lifting, like that's yeah. that nuts and bolts, and trying to schedule a tour. It's so time consuming, yeah. and it's a it's like stressful in a way that I I particularly can't handle, like the stress of booking. Kate, um, our other lead singer, does all of our booking right now, mm-hmm. and it's a it's like a full time job, you know, yeah. just to maintain that communication with every venue, to to do the promotion necessary necessary with those venues, and to yeah, it's. It's a big job. Yeah. So that, I think, is is one of your more valuable assets as sure. a performer if you can get a booking if agent. If there's somebody you trust, like I, I follow a lot of comedians and stand-up comedians and stuff, and when they put tours out, you know, they put together 40 dates. Yeah. And how they connect them, and so they're not ping-ponging back. And, and yeah. Cre- and you see how they stack them up. And I just as a fun exercise, I'm like, what is their route? <laughs> And it, like, it matches kind of perfectly, and then they don't have a whole bunch of nights off. And I can't imagine putting that together. There's an art to it. There has to be. It, it's definitely a learned skill. And I feel like for a while we were booking with this, this person who had never performed, like he wasn't a musician. Mm. And that became very apparent when we started to do very long tours because yeah. he would have us do like 17-hour drive days and then a show, which... If you've never done that, you you know, you're like, oh, it's just 17 hours on paper. Yeah, it's and brutal. it's, you know, straight shot. It shouldn't be too much, right. pro- you know. And, but when you're there and you haven't slept and you've been driving oh. for 20 hours. You can't, no, that's so, going to be, yeah. Your body will be contorted and cramped up by the time you get there. When you're 17, you can do anything. Yeah, sure, <laughs> now, sure. yeah your feet now, are up on the dash. <laughs> If I sit for more than five hours, like, like, oh, my God. You need to roll out on one of those mats and just, like, (laughs) you need a massage when you get there. I do a lot of um, rest stop stretching, Mm -hmm. like rest stop yoga. Yeah. Um, Dan and I do, like, tag team relays, (laughs) running laps around (laughs) different rest stops and gas stations. Oh, wow. But it, it, otherwise, I mean, you just stiffen up. My whole body just feels like a clenched fist all the time anymore, so... It's well, nice to not have to do those well, big drives. Well, if it's anything, you know, I'm 51 and just look what you have to look forward to. <laughs> it only gets better, <laughs> right? Big, yeah, right. <laughs> Your um, hangovers get better, too. Oh, yeah. 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 Schedule a week off. You know. <laughs> the, um, I'm... So I just want to cover a couple things. You're, you're, I'm really excited because you're going to actually sing for us. Yeah. Which we've never done on the podcast before. So you're going to do an acoustic performance of mm-hmm. a song. I don't know what one, which one is it? Do you know what one you want to do? I... Or you didn't pick one? 
I wanted to, I wanted to say that I was prepared, but I also <laughs> I just busted you. That's what it was. She um, brought a guitar, people. We'll I did. find out later. That that much I was prepared for, but <laughs> I I kind of wanted to have the conversation and kind of just see. I, I had practiced a couple. Sure. Um, I've been working on building up a lot of my solo material yeah, lately, yeah. and be fun to hear. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I love performing in the Crane Wives, but there's been a ton of music that I've written that has just kind of sat for a couple yeah. of years, and right. now I'm just trying to figure out what to do with it. Yeah. Well, so. you can put one up here. Nice. We'll figure it out. <laughs> but I do want to talk about because we were chatting during our shoot, mm-hmm. uh, and I, it's an interesting side of you that I wasn't aware of, but you're... You're a graphic designer. Yep. And you have a gig now with a really, really cool organization. And, and if it's okay, can we just talk about that? Because it's oh, just one of yeah. it. it's, it's not really music related, but no. it's. Um, so tell me more about where you're working because it's, it's a really. And, you know, I don't know how much you know about my family, but it's just uh, my. Uh, you know, it's part of. Uh, it's a place. I don't know this organization, but mm-hmm. it's. Uh, the people that they work with are very close to my heart. So in terms of uh, what are you doing, you know, when you're not touring and day-to-day as a graphic designer? Oh, so I, in September, I started working for a nonprofit called Artists Creating Together. And they teach art and other creative practices to individuals with disabilities. Mm-hmm. And I love it. It's, it's a totally different world from music. Um, or graphic design, or any kind of freelance that I've ever done. But it feels like it's so incredibly rewarding to be working with this community, um, not just of, of individuals with disabilities, but with people who are trying to to make the world accessible for everybody, Yeah, which is exciting. It is. <laughs> well, and to use it, you know, an organization that uses arts mm-hmm. um, and... You know, uh, all you know, all aspects of creativity to help people actualize mm. their talents and their joy and whatever it is else that they can yeah. uh, foster and help develop is really really cool. I just I feel like for me, art and music have both been such a big part of of making me not only who I am but making me like a healthier person. Oh, hundred percent. And it's. Incredible to me that those opportunities don't exist for everybody. I mean, I feel very fortunate in that I was able to take lessons from a young age and kind of cultivate the skill mm-hmm. when I was little. But it's it saddens me to think that like the, here's this method of communication that is abstract and and doesn't have like a litmus test and how much you need to know to be able to do it. Right. And I want everyone to have the opportunity to be able to communicate those things inside of them that are abstract Mm -hmm. and hard to understand and be able to get that out in the world. And so it's been really exciting to kind of see the inner workings of how um, a nonprofit that does that operates. So we just moved um, into a bigger studio. There's like a performing arts studio in our office Mm -hmm. for students who um, can come in and, and they teach art classes and music classes. There's a drumming class that gets very loud. <laughs> I love it. I can't imagine. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and it's it's just incredible to see um, students like light up with this new like they get to learn cool new stuff and um, be treated with respect and in a place where they can be. Um, what are the age ranges that you work with? Ooh, all, all age ranges. Okay. So we do, um, we have a youth program that works with school age children. And then we also have adult programs that work with any adults mm-hmm. um, and their caretakers and their siblings. And, you know, we awesome. have open studios on the second Wednesdays of every month. And, and those are open to the public. And it's just this really great way to kind of diversify the community and get to know people who aren't active in other areas like I, it's crazy to me that the other night I worked this um, auction for ACT we did our like um, fundraising auction mm-hmm. and it, it, hundreds of people that I have never met before in my entire life and that's insane like I've lived here for about 15 years and right. how are there this many people that I've never seen before sure. who are actively moving and shaking in my community and trying to make things better so yeah. It's nice. That's awesome. <laughs> so what's a URL for, for ACT? 
um, artistscreatingtogether.org. Awesome. Or um, if you want to find us on Facebook, um, it's like facebook.com slash um, ACTWM for West Michigan. Cool. I'll put links up on your episode page, too, for that Thank stuff. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, of course, to your music and uh, Crane Wives and anything else I can find that we talked about that we'll point to, <laughs> but we'll put it in there. Well, thank you so much. It was awesome getting reconnected with you. Yeah. I'm sorry about the airport. That was <laughs> not cool. My feelings were hurt, but you know what? I think I'll live. Um, I didn't have to disclose it, too. That's the other thing. I could have been like, no. Um, that never I didn't happened. See you. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it wasn't you guys. Yeah, it was you guys, for sure. <laughs> I know it was. Uh, well, anyway, great. best of luck as you guys go in and Thank maybe you. start recording soon, you said? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're hoping to get an album out in 2020, so oh, yeah. eyes out. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Emily. Thank you so much. All right. That was a great conversation with Emily. And there is a lot to check out on Emily's uh, episode page at fullexposurepodcast.com. I've placed a link to uh, Artists Creating Together uh, right out to that organization. If you're interested in learning more about that, um, I'm sure Emily would love for you to check that out. Also, um, on Emily's page is her um, studio session performance of... Um, Empty Spaces a wonderful song you have to see this content hopefully you see it on Facebook or on Emily's episode page at uh, fullexposurepodcast.com I really hope you have a great week again my thanks to Metro Health University of Michigan Health and Dr. Peter Hahn they have made so much possible including these studio sessions they have been a fantastic partner and uh, I cannot wait for 2019 we're exploring other partnerships with people currently, and um, and but Metro Health has been uh, in my court. It's so great to have somebody um, just say, Brian, go for it. Go do it. We've got your back. And Metro Health, University of Michigan Health, and Dr. Peter Hahn have been central to our growth this year, and uh, my utmost uh, thanks to them. All right, let's, uh, let's have a great week, everybody. All right, let's go get it. All right, take care. This Full Exposure podcast episode has been made possible through the support of Metro Health, University of Michigan Health, and Dr. Peter Hahn, who believe that creativity and the arts are essential to a rich, healthy, and fulfilling life.